Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here to Spirit Matters. We're coming at you live from New York. My name is Dal Garunga, and I am your co-pilot today, co-pilot with my live Zoom studio audience from all over the country and the globe, and you, wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you so much for being here. I know I say it every single time, but I mean it. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that we are doing this together. We need each other 100%. And there are people all over the world sending you love and sending you gratitude and sending you appreciation uh, for your connection. There are other people listening, and we are here together doing it. It's your daily spiritual check-in. We've been doing this for a little while, and it's just our way of putting a little spirit into our day, inviting life. There's a beautiful, beautiful verse that's spoken in the biography of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Krishna Surya Sama Maya Hoya Andakar, that Krishna, the supreme absolute truth, is like the sunshine. And uh, Maya illusion is like darkness. And so simply, what was it? Was it Einstein? Anybody? Kimberly want to fact check that? Einstein who said that the, the presence of evil is just simply the absence of good. Am I making that up? Was that some sort of, they're like, yeah, it sounds good enough. And why not? Just attribute it to Einstein. Put Einstein's name on it and it'll sound very, uh, it'll sound quite uh, authoritative. Or maybe it was Martin Luther King. I don't know. But there was just something about the idea that darkness is simply just the absence of, of light. You don't get rid of darkness by trying to suck it out with a vacuum. You simply add, add light. You add sunshine. And so, uh, so similarly in our spiritual life, so many of the things that we try to do, you know, there's so many things we're trying to overcome our lower natures. There was once, I don't have the reference. I wish I had it with me right now. I was in a book. Um, I know the book and I could find if I had the book, but I'm not going to pause and go get it. But there's basically the idea of like, when we come to spiritual life, sometimes it's like turning on the lights in a forgotten closet in your house that you've just been stuffing and storing in for a long time. And you like, you turn on that closet, you turn on the light and you're like, uh, like let's do some spring cleaning. And you turn on the life light. Uh, Oh, St. Augustine said that Dana, you said, um, somebody can find the reference, put it in, Google it. We're on a Google, Google hunt. Um, Oh, there it is. Kimberly put Einstein verified by Google. <laughs> Verified by somebody's random web page. God did not create evil, just as darkness um, is the absence of light. Evil, evil is the absence of good. Evil, evil is the absence of God. Ooh. Einstein, according to Einstein, maybe he took it from St. Augustine, and maybe neither of them said that, and people are just attributing scientists to whatever they want to say. But God did not create evil. Just as darkness is the absence of light, evil is the absence of God. Of, of God. There is a story of, of Surya Dev in Vedic, in Vedic literature of, of the 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 uh, the god of the sun deputed his sun rays to go on a quest to find darkness. I need you to find darkness, and darkness is overtaking the world. Please go find darkness and bring darkness to me. And they searched all over the universe and they were gone for a very long time and they made their way back eventually. And they said, we couldn't find darkness. And the sun said, yes, of course, because wherever you are, there is no darkness. And so for experiencing darkness in our life, we can sometimes get so hyper-focused on trying to remove it, like picking out a splinter with tweezers and just doing into like a surgery to remove all the things in our heart. And sometimes when we come to spiritual life, it feels like that. It feels like why am I getting more angry? Why am I more irritable? Why is everything bothering me all of a sudden? And it's because you're 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 taking off the bandage of an infected wound that has just been kind of ignored or neglected for a very long time and you're opening yourself up to willingly do the work of healing. And sometimes when we avoid our healing work, it feels like we're getting away with it. You know, feels like we're getting away with it. And why would I want to go address that and do that? And the reality is that when we make a decision to come towards our true selves, we're making a decision to move towards love. That love is the highest reality. Um, you don't need to even need to be a spiritualist to believe that. Shakespeare taught it. Everyone uh, 
um, there was a Jay Shetty's on a tour right now. Love rules. He wrote his book, eight rules of love. I saw him in New York. It was really sweet. And uh, just the idea that that love is on the minds of not just spiritually minded people, but just anybody, the search for love, any rom-com that you watch, there's just this, 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 this yearning for love, where to find it, how to get it, how to keep it, um, how to go deep within it. So love is the highest reality. And if that's true, then spirituality itself culminates in the source of love. And so in many ways, God can be defined as that source of love and as the ultimate receptacle of love and the reciprocator of love. And so my search for God is a search for love in the highest degree. And spiritual practice becomes a process of making myself the most available to give and receive love. We all have blockages to love, even in this life, in material life. In the material world, we call it baggage. <laughs> He's got a lot of baggage. I've got a lot of baggage. Some people, sometimes you get in a relationship with someone, you're like, yeah, I don't know if you're going to love me when you find out all of my baggage. Or we may tell that to somebody else. You're going to dump me once you find out all of my baggage. Because we feel that we've got things we're carrying that disqualify us from love. But the reality is that nothing disqualifies us from love. We just need to drop the things that are keeping us from passing through the doorway. It's a beautiful reference. I think I've maybe mentioned this a few times in the Bible about Jesus mentioning that it's easier for a... Uh, camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And it's not that wealth and riches disqualify us, but the attachment sometimes, and sometimes historians say that the eye of the needle is the physical gateway into Jerusalem. And then in order for a camel to pass through that eye of a needle, you'd have to get off the camel, remove all the baggages, and the camel would just have to shimmy its way through that slender doorway. And so similarly, the, the gateway into the heart of God is the shape of our soul. And we just need to drop everything else that we're holding on to, that we're taking. It's like, take only what you need to survive. <laughs> you know? And uh, we're, 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 it's like, you know, you're flying a plane. I was watching that documentary, the MH370 wild documentary about the plane that disappeared in Malaysia, you know, and if you're ever on an airplane, you know, they tell you like in the case of a water landing, meaning like if we crash in the ocean, like leave all of your personal belongings behind, you know, it's like, yeah, you don't take your laptop with you or don't take your, 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 your memory foam neck pillow, like leave it all behind because where we're going, like just survival is more important. And so similarly, when we, when we make our way towards the gateway of love, um, there's a lot of things that we need to leave behind in order to, to, in order to fit through. And when we come to spiritual life, it can be what feels like a rude awakening into like all the things about myself that I didn't want to look at. That's why relationships are so hard. That's why intimate relationships are really hard because it's like, Ooh, every throughout my life, it's like when it's, something gets uncomfortable, I can just I can just change jobs, I can just move apartments, I can just I can just you know st stop hanging out with that friend or give it a week until we see each other again. But when you're with an intimate partner, it's like every day, it's like you can't run from all the icky, gooey, sticky, uncomfortable things about yourself. Like it all comes up, and we have a choice to look at. You know what? Am I really going to allow myself to look at all the things in myself? Or am I just going to start blaming other people and the circumstances in life and blah, 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 blah. And so spirituality in some ways is the most intimate of relationships. We're di diving into a deep relationship with ourselves, with God, with all living beings. And so coming to spiritual life can be like a jolt where you start to notice all the things about yourself that are getting in the way of love. And so, felt like I was tying all of this in. And now, where did I start 
turning on the light in our room. Yes, Krishna Surya Sama, Maya Hoya Andakara, Einstein, that God, evil is just the absence of God in our life. And so um, we simply have to continuously, we, 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 we see, found it, Kimberly, found it. We see all of the things that we want to change and we can get hyper-focused on trying to correct the negative. But really what we're invited to do in spiritual life is just overflow the positive. If you have a glass of water and there's a little dirt in it, you know, you can get a little sieve or tweezers and try to pick out every little particle of dirt. Or you can just hold it under a clean faucet and just let fresh water continuously pour in. And everything gets flushed out and, uh, and washed away. And what you're left with is a beautiful, pristine glass of clean water. And we are ourselves innately pure and spiritual. And so as we try to just kind of get rid of all the muck that we've accumulated, we're like a gem. Each of you are like a beautiful gem. One of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, wrote this beautiful book called Immortal Diamond. I haven't read that, that book, but I've read a couple of his other books, but I like the title, Immortal Diamond. We're all a precious ruby, sapphire, topaz. Is topaz a, a gem? That's my birthstone. I felt like topaz was one of like the less elegant ruby, sapphire, diamond, topaz. Anyways, that's my birthstone, topaz, November. Um, go topaz. Um, and uh, whatever gem you are, and if you have a gem and it's, you roll it down a hill and it collects dirt and mud and just cakes on layer and layer and layer of dirt and mud and eventually just feels, looks like a clump of earth. And the solution isn't to somehow like add shine to it. It's just remove all the layers of dirt and clump and let the natural shine of that topaz come forth. <laughs> and so similarly in spiritual life, it's just a matter of we are already naturally beautiful and shining. And we just got to add Krishna into our life. And that's why we're here. We're here for a little spiritual reminder. Um, Leela Mundry. Yep, we got the muddy orange gem. Yay. Are you a you November birthday too, Leela Mundry? Leslie's a pearl. Pearl is a birthstone? What kind of, what kind of, what kind of month, what month gets pearl? June, June, ruby, sapphire. Can somebody get me a list of birthstones? There's got to be something, something, uh, some, is there something else that can, that gets a topaz? What else is out there? July is a ruby? Sapphire is September? God, these beautiful gems. We got the topaz, topaz crew. Anyways. There's probably, there's got to be some hidden quality. If somebody look up good qualities of a topaz, make me feel better about myself before I get off of this podcast. Anyways, let's shift gears. And um, we're reading Bhagavad Gita. We, we've been reading the Bhagavad Gita a while ago. We took a break from the podcast. If some of you know that we had a couple weeks break, a spring break, early spring break, winter break, whatever you want to call it. And um, we had our good friend Rukmini with us last week. I had my good friend Kishore Gopal lined up this week, but he's not able to make it. Next week, next week, I got my wife, Rasika Gopi, is going to be on with us. If you've got questions for us, check my Instagram. I'm going to be posting where you can share questions that you want to ask my wife and I for next week. But this week, we're going to kick back off and reading Bhagavad Gita. Ooh, we got, a, we got a note on Topaz. Topaz is considered a mellow, empathic stone that soothes, heals, recharges, and recenters its wearers. Aww. associated with compassion and communication it's a preferred stone to wear for building bridges between people uh dana k wrote the topaz is known for its soothing and calming effects wearing the stone will help you have the confidence to rise to any occasion your heart desires anyone wearing the topaz is on the path to good health and fortune okay i'll take that thank you topaz Sometimes beauty is within, okay, guys? Sometimes beauty is in the qualities of a person, not in the external shine, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're reading Bhagavad Gita, and uh, from a while ago, we left off in chapter four. Kimberly checked our notes, 
And um, she said the last verses we read were what? 7, 8, and 9. Bhagavad Gita 7, 8, 9, chapter 4. So we're in chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita, which means we'd be on chapter 10. Is that correct? Um, That's right. We're at 410 right now. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay. Uh, 410. Beautiful verse. A lot going on in this verse. Um, my friend Kastuba um, has a beautiful assessment of the Bhagavad Gita and the kind of the journey of spiritual evolution. He coined this phrase, spiritual evolution. Well, I'm sure maybe other people use it, but he uses it in particular context. Um, and we go to India every year um, in January. We just got back and we teach wisdom literatures. He teaches from the Bhagavad Gita. I teach from two other books, The Nectar of Instruction, Nectar of Devotion. And his whole framing of the Bhagavad Gita is based off of these five principles of duty, knowledge, wisdom, absorption, and love. Um, so duty as the first step of controlling the mind, um, meaning that I want to just do whatever my mind and senses tell me, but a sense of duty, a sense of dharma in this life, my conditional dharma, my, my material duties of life. Um, I want to sleep in my, uh, my friend Dunya just got back from India recently and she's posting on her Instagram, you know, their journey back, like the 30 hour journey from India back to New York and the stopovers. And they got two kids. One of them is a, is a less than a year old. And, uh, she's, Talk, posting about how they're getting over jet lag and it's like three in the morning and the baby's wide awake and you know you're trying to get over your own jet lag and a baby's jet lag and you know you want to just sleep in but the baby's hungry and you wake up why because it's a higher duty i feel like i just want to sleep in but my duty is calling me out of bed to take care of somebody else you know and so when we have responsibilities in life, when we feel a sense of responsibility to something outside of ourselves, whether it be our family, our occupation, our relationships, our spiritual practice, it pulls us out of, of a sense of being a slave to our mind and senses. And it starts to hone our, starts to chip away at our attachments. And it starts to um, put us into a realm of higher intelligence. So duty being the first step towards spiritual realization, spirit duty. And therefore we have all of these yamas and the niyamas and the, and the practices and et cetera. And start to train the mind. Duty, knowledge. Knowledge is what guides the things we become dutiful towards. And knowledge eventually transforms into wisdom, which is I know something, but now I'm starting to operate from a deep place of realization. Of, of understanding how the world really works and separating myself from immediate knee-jerk reactions. And then from that wisdom, I can actually engage in absorption. I could actually start to absorb my mind intentionally, which is where we want to go with our spiritual practice, which is the nature of love, duty, knowledge, absorb, duty, knowledge, wisdom, absorption, and ultimately in love. What is love but a complete absorption in, 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 in relationship of another? And so, but I can't get to those stages of absorption and love if uh, my mind and my senses are pulling me in, in, in 10 different directions. So this verse, Bhagavad Gita 4.10, um, references all of these beautiful principles that he speaks about. And so, and so he, he's, I'm crediting Kastuba for unlocking a huge... Uh, realization of this beautiful verse and, and what Krishna is sharing. We can see all those concepts here. Um, so chapter, chapter 4, verse 10 of the Bhagavad Gita. Being freed from attachment, fear, and anger. Being fully absorbed in me, Krishna is speaking about himself. Being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me, many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me. And thus they all attained transcendental love for me. Let's read it again. Being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me, many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental love for me. So being freed from attachment, duty, this word duty, I don't know if a more relevant word 
a healthy responsibility. Uh, dharma is a word that's used to translate. Um, dharma is not used in this verse, but the idea of of my my dharmas in this life and my family and my occupation, like my. So, I Krishna previously in the third chapter talks about performing your dharma in this life and not trying to follow another's path because performing our duties in life helps free us from attachment because I'm no longer operating from a place of what's in it for me and I'm seeing myself as part of a greater whole. So becoming free from attachment, which helps relinquish me from fear and anger um, and being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me. Many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me. So by the cultivation of knowledge that leads to wisdom, I can start to actually, I'm no longer thinking about what's in it for me. I'm no longer worrying about all the petty little things that I become so obsessed with. I can let those things go. I can just do the right thing. Do the next right thing. And allow myself to get absorbed in higher subjects. And through that, and if I allow Krishna to be that higher subject, I could attain transcendental love. Let's look at some of the commentary that Prabhupada writes. It's a quite a long commentary. Hmm. We'll read one or two sentences and then we will wrap it up. As described above, it is very difficult for a person who is too material affected to understand the personal nature of the supreme absolute truth. So the supreme, the personal nature of the supreme absolute truth goes back to the idea of us accepting that love is the highest reality. Love is the pinnacle of experience that we yearn for. Love is the constitutional nature of the soul. And therefore, the journey of the soul is like a river flowing to the ocean, which is the source of loving exchange. And when we flow into that ocean, we do not lose our identity and merge into the oneness of spirit because that itself would eliminate the possibility of love because love is an exchange between two people, between two entities. And so therefore, Krishna says it very clearly in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Natuevaham Never was there a time when any of us did not exist, nor in the future saw any of us cease to be, meaning our individuality is permanent. Because when you flow into that unlimited, unending ocean of love, you maintain your individuality, as do I, because that allows us to exchange affection and love and joy. And so it can be quite bewildering for people to think of God as a person because all of my pain in life has come from people. The deepest wounds in my life have come from betrayals and people letting me down and all the flaws that come with being a person. And we lose sight of the fact that just because I've experienced pain in relationships in this world, it doesn't mean that, that, that what I'm experiencing is just simply a perverted reflection of genuine spiritual identity and, and, and relationship in the spiritual world. And God ultimately being that supreme person, able to exchange love completely and endlessly with every living being on the most intimate and deep level. That is the that is the beauty. That is the mystery. Krishna mentions even as much the mystery of my understanding. Later on in the Gita, that it's 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 the the mind can take you only so far. It drops you off at a place where the heart must traverse forward. And that God is that person who can unlimitedly expand to enter the heart of every living being and touch the life of every living being unlimitedly and at the same time, most intimately 
It's kind of like the more contacts you have, the less you're able to be in touch with them. Anybody ever like lose sight, lose track of like their text messages and WhatsApp messages because it's like, you know, they get lost in the shuffle and I lost track and I didn't respond to that email because like the more, the more people I'm in touch with, the less able I'm able to be in touch with them. Not so for the supreme absolute truth. That God can very deeply, intimately, on the deepest level, reciprocate with the love of every person, and it doesn't diminish God's ability to do that for everybody. So Prabhupada mentions in the first line of the purport, as described above, it is very difficult for a person who is too materially affected to understand the personal nature of the supreme absolute truth. So that's what we're going to dive into later because we are all out of time we try to keep it short and sweet here at spirit matters um and uh, we got the rest of this beautiful purport but we take our time to look at uh some of our takeaways if any of our any of our live zoomers here want to share some takeaways we also turn it over to kimberly who's our wrap it up acharya kimberly's going to share some takeaways i'll share a closing word a couple of closing announcement and uh then i'll send you on your way what you got for us kimberly got lots of good takeaways today um spiritual practice is making ourselves the most available to give and receive love mm, spiritual practice is making ourselves the most available to give and receive love i really like that mm. and nothing disqualifies us from that love mm. preach it sister <laughs> yes <laughs> overflow the positive mm, love let, these <laughs> let the topaz's natural shine come forth oh uh, where my topaz is at <laughs> love is complete absorption our individuality is permanent and allows us to exchange affection and joy and god can intimately reciprocate with all of us unlimitedly Mm, beautiful. Love that. Thank you, Kimberly. So beautiful. Leslie said that. Just add sunshine. I like that one. Uh, I love how I like how Lila Mundry mentioned how how uh the the topaz is the building bridges stone, which is quite needed because the Scorpios were normally uh burning the bridges. <laughs> so if you're a November, early November baby and you're a Scorpio, you're burning the bridge, and then you need this. So the gods are like these people need topaz. These people need topaz to, to repair the pitches that they burnt. I was, yeah, anyways, I can tell, I'll tell Scorpio stories in the next, later this week, we'll, we'll share some Scorpio stories. Um, beautiful. I love that so much. Um, and uh, yeah, meditation just in general, where am I adding sunshine in my life and how am I relating to God as a person? You know? How am I relating to God as we're just as an experiment? If you already believe and accept a personal God, there is there is this book that somebody wrote called The Christian Atheist, which is the idea that like we might theoretically believe in something, but how much do I live with that understanding? So I invite all of us to deepen into our awareness and understanding. My dog is barking in the background, if you can hear. He he feels that I'm about to end and he's like, okay, wrap it up. So we can go play. Um, and um, and if not, if that idea of personal God is like, that is nuts and crazy, and why would I ever do that? Just open yourself up to an experiment just for a day, for a week, and just be like, I want to invite personal presence of love into my life and just make that little tiny, little tiny prayer in the heart. Okay. I got to run. I love you guys. I'm grateful for all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, please check out all the cool stuff we've got going on at the Bhakti Center. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's still an Ayurvedic spring cleanse happening this weekend, which I encourage all of you, don't miss out. Get your body and mind in alignment um, by taking a very simple Ayurvedic spring cleanse, an eight-day guided Kitchery detox led by my wife, Rasika Gopi. Um, we've also got a bunch of other cool community groups and other offerings you can check out, yoga teacher trainings, retreats, India pilgrimages. Uh, check it all out at bhaktisenter.org. Um, and we'd love to stay in touch with you. Um, be safe, be well, see you tomorrow. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.